This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad therein. Good morning to Vision and good morning to those of you who are on the line that are not a part of Vision. Thank you for joining us on today. This is the day again, as we say, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad therein. I'm not going to prolong the time. I'm going to go ahead with the morning scripture. And our morning scripture is coming from Psalms 150. It says, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psalter and harp. Praise him with the temporal and dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord didn't leave anything out. Anything we didn't leave anything out. So it says, "Praise Him." And right now we know we're in the church, but guess what? This is our sanctuary. Right now in our homes, as our sanctuary. So praise Him in the sanctuary. Praise Him with everything you got. Praise Him. That's all that is saying. Praise Him. Praise Him. I'm going to go ahead with our prayer, and then I have something that I'm going to read to us because today is a special day. So this prayer says, "Lord." It can be easy for me to entertain thoughts that are negative or harmful to me, but I want to have a mindset that reflects your good and pure nurture, nature. So please protect my thoughts and renew my mind daily. And as you do that, remove all negativity and fill my mind with joyful thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said today, today is a special Sunday. It's actually Pentecost Sunday. This is what we say. So as the scripture says, Acts 1 and 8, but ye shall receive power. And after that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So happy Pentecost Sunday, everybody. And just a little bit of, uh, of what Pentecost Sunday is. Pentecost is one of the great uh, festivals of the church. But many people, including Christians, may not know what the day why the day is special or why it is celebrated or what it's celebrated. It marks the coming of the Holy Spirit on the disciples and their transformation from frightened and confused people to men who would face martyrdom for what they believe. Pentecostal is from the Greek word Pentecostos, which means 50. It's the 50th day after the Sabbath of Passover week and in Judaism is called the Feast of Weeks. Leviticus 23 and 16. So nine things that we want you to remember about the Pentecost. Pentecost means 50, 50. Pentecost Sunday occurs 50 days after Easter. Pentecost Sunday marks the day when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. Pentecost comes 10 days after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Two is traditionally celebrated as white sun. The word Pentecost has become more common in the UK, but traditionally the church celebrated it as Whitsun, which was White Sunday. It's believed that this is because it was a day for baptisms and those being baptized would wear white. Another explanation is that it derives from the Anglo-Saxon word wit, which we still use for verbal cl uh, cleverness, but what, which meant understanding. Pentecost was when God poured out the wisdom of the spirit. In Western churches, Pentecost is usually represented with the color red, which symbolizes the fire of the Holy Spirit. Three, there's debate about speaking in tongues. The Bible records the Pentecost in Acts 2, 1 through 13. The Pentecostal movement derives its name from the New Testament events in Acts 2. Luke tells the story in Acts 2, uh, 1 through 13. Some scholars think he was referring to an expression of glas lalaya, or speaking in tongues, an ecstatic outpouring of praise in an unknown language. Others point out that what the disciples said seems to have been misunderstood by their hearers. For Pentecost is the fulfillment of two promises. Pentecost fulfills Jesus' promises to send the counselor 
and spirit of truth in John 16, 5 through 15. One promise is in the Old Testament, Joel 2, 28, which says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And one in the New Testament where Jesus says he will send another counselor, the spirit of truth, John 16, 5 through 15. Number five, modern day Pentecostals emphasize the gifts of the spirit. Pentecostals are so are so called because of the emphasis they place on the spirits, uh, the gifts of the spirits, particularly speaking in tongues. They stress the possibility of a direct personal experience of God, like the first disciples, which just as it was then, is often manifested in dramatic ways. Modern Pentecostals trace their origins to the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 in Los, Los Angeles. Six, there was wind. Luke tells of three distinct experiences, a violent wind in the house, breath or wind is a symbol of the spirit of God. Ezekiel 37 tells the story of the prophet's vision of the valley of dry bones, which comes together when the breath of God enters them. They come to life, they stand on their feet. The Pentecost wind represents the power of God to bring life to the dry bones of faith. Seven and tongues of fire. Tongues of fire separate and come to rest on each of them. Jesus told his disciples, you are the light of the world. Matthews 5, 14. In John 8 and 12, he says, I am the light of the world. The picture, <coughs> excuse me, in Acts seems to be of a single flame that separates and symbolically rests on each of them. The disciples will do what Jesus did. Eight and other languages. The nature of the origin of experience has been queried, but in Luke's telling of it, it, the point is that it breaks down barriers between people. The story links back to one of the earliest of the Old Testament stories in Genesis 11, where the people began to build the huge tower of Babel. God confuses their language so they can no longer understand each other. At Pentecost, this Babel confusion is reversed. And nine, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Pentecost is also known as the birthday of the church. Pentecost launches the large scale spreading of the gospel after Jesus' ascension. Acts 2 and 41 records that after Peter spoke to the crowd after receiving the Holy Spirit, some 3,000 people were baptized. So what does this mean to us? What personal implications does this have for us? Pentecost presents us with an opportunity to consider how we're living each day. Are you relying on the power of God's spirit? Are we an open channel for the spirit's gifts? Are we attentive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Is the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., growing in our lives? Am I serving God through the power of the spirit? <clears throat> Excuse me. Am I exercising the gifts of the spirit in my life? both in the gathered church and as I live for God in the world. So Pentecost invites us to, as, uh, to consider our own participation in the fellowship, worship, and mission of the church. It is a time to renew our commitment to live as an essential member of the body of Christ, using our gifts to build the church and share the love and justice of Christ with the world. Pentecost is a time to ask God to fill us afresh with the spirit so that we might join in the ministry of Christ with gusto. And it is a time to renew our commitment to fulfilling our crucial role in the ministry of God's people in the world. In summary, God's divine appointment, his purpose, his presence, his prosperity. As the saying here, it says, Pentecost, ignite your faith, ignite your passion, and ignite your life. So just a little bit about Pentecost Sunday. And I am going to move forward with our service. Good morning, good morning, God bless you. Praise the Lord, speak to my heart. <laughs> I'll never go on my own, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord today for who he is. Praise the Lord today for what he's done. Praise the Lord today for what he's going to do. And praise the Lord today for who he has made us. I am grateful and thankful for another day. Welcome to Vision for the World Ministries. Today, 
whose voice is speaking to us? I guess you took note of the theme of the songs. Whose voice is speaking to us? Amen. She did some throwbacks in there. Dr. Marbley has moved my spirit with, with those. I, I, I saw the Canton spiritual lead singer. <laughs> Amen. I love them. I, I absolutely love them. And I saw a young Kurt Franklin. Amen. In the videos. Praise the Lord. Let us begin. We're not going to prolong the time. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This is verses 1 through 5. Genesis chapter 3. For those that want to read along in their own Bibles, or you can read along with us. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and, your, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And it continues... Mm -hmm. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Mm -hmm. And then it finally concludes. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gave it to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Again, whose voice is speaking to us? As we introduce this, and then we move through, I promise we won't be long. Many things attempt to speak to us throughout the course of development from childhood all the way to adulthood. What we internalize could become our reality. The things that are consistently said by those of whom we admire and respect can have a lasting value on what we believe is truth. Let us be careful to whom we let speak into our lives and whose voice we pay attention to. Let's begin. Uh, number one, uh, first point, and then we're going to fill in some of the verses, if you all don't mind, is the origin, the origin of, of whomever and whoever speaks to us as humans and individuals on the earth. And first and foremost is our parents that should be the first voices of influence. That should be the first voices of influence. Unfortunately and sadly, it's not always the case in many of our lives and many of our upbringing. Some of us have very loving and caring parents, and, and there may be some who did not. And, but those, those should have been the first voices of influence in our lives. Secondly, be are the teachers. Most of, us had, most of us were told and made and ushered into school. Most of us were, uh, and that was our life when we were young. And we were influenced by our teachers, whomever was in the head of the class, and whoever was responsible for relaying information to us, we were influenced. That, that, these are the origins, these are the origins. And of course, uh, extended and other family members. This, these, this is where we develop values. This is where we learn most of the lessons or it, either good or bad. This is where we learned them. We, we, it came from the parents, <coughs> excuse me, and then the teachers, and then, of course, the family members, and in, in other words, our home. Now, there are other things that could be added to this, like community, and, and um, uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a moment. But the, this is the origin of who is speaking to us. 
and who we have allowed to speak to us. This is the origin. Reflect back, and we'll get back to the garden very quickly in point number three, but reflect back on who Adam and Eve were speaking to. Reflect back on who they were, who they were talking to, who was talking to them, especially in terms of this category here. <coughs> Excuse me, this category here represents the authority in our lives, the origins of the authority in our lives. Who was in authority speaking to Adam and Eve? But let's keep going. I told you it won't be long, and I promise it won't be painful either. The pressures, now the origins and then the pressures, our peers, the news, coworkers, bosses, etc. Who's speaking to us after the, after the origin or the base or the foundation? We then begin to branch out, and our, our hearing is expanded. Because there are others that enter the picture, especially when we start to go away to school. And, and I, I said teachers in terms of authority, but there are so many others that exist in the school. There's the friends and the peers and, and the best friends. There's so many stories that we probably could tell, but there's so many stories that we've heard time and time again about peer pressure and about what's happened with the peers. I am especially thinking now. Uh, I really, 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 really am thinking now because I hear so much about uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, the, the internet pressure, uh, cyber bullying. I'm sorry, I was trying to think of the term, the cyber bullying and the things that are taking place on the internet and, and through, that, through, through that median. I am just absolutely amazed at how the communication has, more, has, has transformed and morphed into something else. It used to be where the pressure from the peers would have been in an in-person type of situation where, I mean, maybe your hair wasn't like everyone else's hair or, or maybe the clothing wasn't like everyone else's clothing. But now they're not even necessarily together or seeing each other. And this pressure is paramount. This pressure is amazing. It's unbelievable. They say that, that, that the cyber suicide rate is higher than it's ever been because of who or whom, well, it's speaking to us. Whom is speaking to us? The news. The news shapes and forms the, the situations and the circumstances around the world. It paints a picture if you will, with little snippets and, and little stories and little spins and, and, and little tucks here and little clips and nicks there. The news can completely transform something that we thought was, and they can literally make it something else. I was speaking to a group of people not long ago about how the media has the ability to either lift up or destroy a product or an industry for a short period of time. And it appears that every year there are certain industries that the media, either it attacks or either it's truthful. I don't know, but uh, sometimes it's tomatoes or, or lettuce. Uh, sometimes it's fish or, or it was mad cow or it was, it was mean monkey. Uh, I, I don't know how many of the, of the various of the various industries were affected. It was strawberries at one time. Uh, it was peaches. It, if, if it comes through the news and comes uh, on the media, there are, there is, in our groups of people who completely believe it, completely receive it, because that's the voice that they're listening to. That's the voice that they're paying attention to. That's who's speaking to them, coworkers, bosses, etc. We spend so much time on our jobs. For those of us that have a job, and some of, us, some of us have businesses, we spend so much time in those arenas, in those areas, that we're bound to be influenced by someone. I don't know if our entire concentration is solely upon the job at hand. I mean, in other words, if, I don't know if we just go to work and we're single-minded. We're single-minded. We're, we're, we're just going to, to do the job. We're, we're not going to be influenced or move one way or the other. There's not going to be any uh, uh, around the water bubbler conversations. There, there, there's not going to be any uh, uh, lunch sessions. We, we're just focused. Well, we know that that's not true. Of course, the time and the people that we spend the most time with has the ability to have the most influence in our lives. They have the ability. There's an etc. there because it could be anyone. It could be a number of people. But the question is in the title, 
And the thought I hope that it's provoking is whose voice is speaking to us? And when I talk about speaking to us, I'm not simply saying something that we're listening to, something that we're hearing, but a voice that's penetrating, a voice that's actually getting through, a voice that's actually causing us to matriculate, causing us to consider, causing us to ponder. What voice? Is it the preacher's voice? Does it happen with church? Is it a song? <clears throat> Excuse me, is it on the internet? Is it on uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, Snapchat, uh, Instagram? I don't know all, all of those different things. What voice? Whose voice is literally speaking to us? Let's, let's go to the next point. We're almost done. We are at church. I said, tell your neighbor, you're going too fast. Tell your neighbor, he's almost done. The enemy described the enemy is the point number three let's talk about <coughs> excuse me let's talk about who eve and adam were hearing from the enemy was is described in ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 through 16 this is a description um if you will of the devil uh here's this description son of man take up a lamentation upon the king of tyrus and say unto him that saith the lord god Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealed up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's how he looked. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering. This is what he was covered with. The sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the and gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets. In other words, thy thy uh Pipes and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Now he was created this way, and this is how he looked. He was beautiful, and it sounds like he had just a wonderful, melodious voice. Now, who wouldn't love to? Be, well, we all do. I, I mean, every every part of entertainment takes this particular uh, description, if you will, or this formula, if you will, for description. They try to make the entertainers as pretty, and they try to have them sound as good or as pleasant as necessary. Because let's all face it, uh, many of us are, are visual creatures, especially men, and it, it's it's you can look at a beautiful singing person with, with just a melodious, just a smooth voice. Let's finish it. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, Thou was upon the holy mountain of God, and thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. Sixteen verse says, "By the multitude of thy merchandise, they they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub." from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, he, the, the devil was given, uh, we're calling him the enemy in this point, but he was given all of his ability by God. And he was created perfect and he was created beautiful. And, and he was created with a great ability to lift up God in praise. His pipes were prepared, it says, pipes was prepared the day it was created. So he was created talk, <laughs> created with this great ability. And he was a covering cherub. He was an angel, and he still is an angel. He's just a fallen angel. He, he's an angel, and he was a covering cherub. He was designed and made to lift up God and to give God glory. But then it says that it says that by the multitude of his merchandise that he was filled with violence, that things were things were discovered in him, found in him that shouldn't have been, and that he sinned. And then God told him, "I'm putting you out, getting out of the mountain of God." Adam going to destroy you. Now that's interesting. Now listen, that's the enemy described. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's talk about the enemy discovered. We have to go to Isaiah for that. Isaiah, the 14th chapter, 12 through 15 verses. I'm almost done. I promise I'm, we're almost done. We're almost done. The enemy discovered. Now he was described by Ezekiel. His discovery was given to us by Isaiah. Isaiah uh, uh, 14, 12 says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? 
For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Now he was discovered. Isaiah told him that he was discovered. It was, his name was Lucifer, which means uh, son of the morning or bright morning star. That was literally his name. And he was, he was described in Ezekiel. So we know what he looks like. We know what he sounds like. And now we know what happened to him. Because he got this notion, this idea that he was going to ascend and become God. That he would be on the mountain. That he would sit on the throne. And because of it, God sees that and deems that as iniquity. And because of it, God put him out. Kicked him out. Now, the question is, before we go to the conclusion, see, see, that wasn't long at all. That wasn't even painful, was it? The question is, what does this have to do with Adam, Adam and Eve? <clears throat> right? That's the question. It, it is. It, it, and it's a, it's a legitimate question. What does it have to do with Adam and Eve? Well, these events that took place with the enemy happened before the enemy hit the earth. Isaiah describes when he hit the earth. And so now this foe, this enemy, this one that messed up in Eden, the one that messed up in the Mount of God is on the earth. And God now has crafted the earth and built things and made a garden. We read it and, and he put Adam in the middle of it and Adam did all the things that he had to do. And now, it's, now it says that this enemy has inhabited the serpent. Now there are some verses that you can research and find that I didn't put them all in because I don't want to take all of your day. But the, the Bible describes the devil as entering the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So this enemy of God is now on the earth in a garden. And he's trying to and he's trying to talk and to mess up Adam and Eve. And that brings us full circle to whose voice is speaking to us. Now, we just talked about who he is, and this is who he was speaking to. He was speaking to Adam and Eve, and he was subtle. He was crafty. He was smart. He was slick, and, and he came and he approached Eve, and you all know what happened when he approached Eve. He approached her and asked her about what God said, and the enemy's main, main idea, or shall I say intent, is to keep us from doing what God said. And a part of being able to do that is to try to disturb or disguise or distort what God said. Try to disguise it or distort it or disturb it. Try to change it and hoping that we didn't really hear it well. Hoping that some way and somehow we didn't really listen carefully to God so that he's hoping that we'll listen to him. <sighs> hoping that we'll listen to him. So this is what happened. But the fruit of the, the third verse says, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall she touch it, lest she die. Now, the enemy knew then, as he was speaking to Eve about what God said about eating in the garden and the trees, he knew then, I think he had an idea then, uh-oh, I got her, because I heard her say something that God didn't say. So I'm pretty clear and sure that she didn't listen carefully. I'm pretty clear and sure that she's a little bit confused as to what's going to happen. So because she already has this confusion, because she already has this misinformation, I can just simply add to it. I can agree with a part of it and then add something else to try and take her off pace, off course. And here's what here's what I read a little bit earlier. From the beginning, Satan has, Satan has tried to undermine God's people by undermining undermining God's word. He can undermine just as effectively by getting us to neglect God's word as by getting us to doubt it. Sometimes it's not a matter of trying to get me to doubt or I mean to neglect what God said, but to get me to doubt it, to get me to think that maybe it's just not clear. And then I have to really start considering who voice, whose voice am I really listening to? And who is this that's trying to clarify what God said? And I'm not quite sure within myself, and you can touch the neighbor and say, he's rolling now, but I, I'm not quite sure within myself why 
Eve and Adam didn't say, well, just hold up. You just hang in there because I think you're wrong. I don't think that's what God said, but he'll be here pretty soon. He'll be here pretty soon. We're going to ask him because he's the one that told us what to do. He's the one that told us about it. And we really don't know who you are. We really don't know. Did he tell you? Did you speak to him? How do you know what's going to happen if we eat after we, because we know what God said. And so we start to question again, whose voice is speaking to us? Whose voice? Now, here's what the enemy said. He says, has God indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? That's what he said. Has he indeed said that? Satan took God's positive command of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, and rephrased it in a negative way. In other words, God won't let you eat of every tree? Oh, just consider that. I mean, that's pretty smooth. He probably said, what? God won't let you eat of every tree? And then he said, and we can't touch it. And he won't let you touch it? What kind of God is that? Oh, we've heard that, y'all. We've heard those voices. We've heard voices that say, what kind of God would do what's being done? What kind of God won't let you do what you do? What kind of God won't let you have this fun? What kind of God won't let you commit this act? What kind of God is that? Yes, that's him trying to change the negative. That's him trying to change the narrative, I'm sorry, and make it and make what's positive negative. Now, God said you can eat out of every tree except the ones that are in the middle. You can't eat on them. And if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. Now, he, you got a whole lot of trees to eat from. That's the positive. You got everything you need in this garden. Everything. And everybody in the garden is well taken care of. Everything in the garden is well taken care of. Rivers are flowing in. It's got the water. It's got the trees. And it's got the almighty coming in the cool of the day, communicating every day. But somehow, in some way, another voice entered in. And, and they kept listening. They kept listening. And four and five says, and then we're going to close, I promise. It says, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doeth know the day that you eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now he's really trying to change what God said. Trying to change what God said. Uh, he said, you, you won't die. Now, some people say, um, especially in the age of the new movement, uh, they, here, let me read it to you. What the Jewish rabbi said. Here's what they said. Jewish rabbis embellished on Satan's temptation of Eve. Nothing malice, nothing but malice has prompted God's command. But as soon as you eat of it, you will be as God. As he creates and destroys worlds, so will you have the power to create and destroy. As he does kill and revive, so will you have the power to kill and revive. God himself ate first of the fruit of the tree, and then he created the world. Therefore, he forbids you to eat of it, Lest you create each, uh, lest you create other worlds. Hurry now and eat the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, and become independent of God. Lest He bring forth still other creatures that will rule over you. That's one of the Jewish translations of what the enemy was really trying to put out to Eve. He was really trying to say, "Yeah, you're not going to really die." especially not if you touch it. And then some Jewish, some, some uh, believe that, that as the serpent said that to Eve, he bumped her and made her touch it, the tree. And it says, now, now the, again, this is not what's written in the Bible. We're just music. He bumped, they say, some say they bumped her, made her touch the tree and then told her, look, you didn't die. You're still alive. You touched it. Then he told her, he ate from it. Now he don't want you to. This is, the, this is what's muse. He created worlds. Now he, doesn't, now he doesn't want you to have that power. He said, you're not going to die. It, then he's, then there, there was this idea, look at the fruit. Look at it. It looks good. I digress, I digress and ask again, as I asked earlier, I don't understand. And I guess I won't understand. God has his way and God knows what he's doing. I don't understand why they didn't say, well, hold it. Wait a minute, because Adam was there. How come Adam was there? Hold up, hold up, man, hold up. 
Hold on, hold up, partner. Wait just a minute. Hold your horses. Curb that. Bring it to a stop. Let's wait. God will be here pretty soon. He'll be here pretty soon, man. And we can talk to him about that. When did, in fact, when did you talk to God? I didn't see you up there, man. I see you. When God brought you to me to name, I don't remember you talking like this. I don't remember. Do you remember when I named you? Yeah, yeah, that same God that brought you before me to name. He'll be here in a few minutes. So we'll talk to him. Hold up, Eve. Hang on. We're going to talk to God and find out what, you know, what's going on with these trees and find out about this, this touching stuff and find out about, uh, about us becoming uh, gods. And, and I, I just don't know about all that. So hold up. But that didn't happen. He didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. In fact, the voice began to penetrate her, shall I say, curiosity. It began to penetrate. Somehow or another, this voice was speaking to her. And it must have been speaking to him too, because he was there. Somehow, this voice began to speak. Now, I'm not just talking about talking, because a lot of people tell us a lot of things, and we don't do it. Now, truthfully, you hear a number of things, you don't do it. You only do from who really spoke to. We only do from by who really spoke to us. And, and that's, again, we went through our origin. We went through our pressures. We only really respond and act to who's really speaking to us. And that's why the title is so precious today. Whose voice is speaking to us? Whose voice? Eve did, you all know the story. She, she, it says she looked on a fruit and she thought it was you know, pretty decent. It looked pretty good. And she took some and she ate it. Some say it was an apple. I don't know what it is. I don't want to argue that. Don't know what it was. Right. She ate it and then say she gave it to Adam who was, there with us and say he did eat too. Wow. And a part of what the serpent said was true. Their eyes did open, but their eyes opened to the sin that they had just committed. Their eyes opened to their inadequacies. Their eyes opened to their inabilities. Oh, they remembered that God said, don't do it. But they did do it. Let me read you something else. And and I promise I'm going to the close and you can tell your neighbor, that's the third door. Yeah. The new age, the new age movement and desire to be God are just as strong as now first, let, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the goal of the goal of becoming God is the center of so many non-Christian religions, including Mormonism. Listen, but in the, but in our desire to be gods, we become like Satan who said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne, my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high instead of being like Jesus who became as a servant. The new age movement and the desire to be God are just as strong as ever. Now there was a survey in 1992, according to a 1992 survey, as many as 12 million Christians can be considered active participants in the new age movement. And another 30 million are avidly interested now, this was in 92. Imagine how large that number is now. If all these people were brought together in a church-like organization, it would be the third largest religious denomination in America. And guess what, family, vision, it is. It is now considered the third largest religious uh, uh, organization in America. More than 90% of the describers to the New Age magazine are college graduates compared to half the general population. Now get this last little bit. In 1995, New Age influence made its way all the way to the White House. New Age author Marianne Williamson, writer of A Course in Miracles, guru to many of Hollywood's spiritual seekers, spent a night at the White House as the personal guest of Hillary Clinton. And Anthony Robbins, motivational guru and king of late night infomercials, consulted with President Clinton at Camp David. Robbins is also recognized as a leader in the New Age movement. Just some things that we may not have known about what's really happening 
and how voices and the word of God is being distorted by various voices, that the, this distortion today is not new. It was distorted in the very beginning. It was distorted in the third chapter of Genesis. And because of it, because of being susceptible to another voice, because of being susceptible to another voice, literally getting a chance to penetrate and speak, it caused a fall. And man's fall was fast. After they did that, we read the scriptures. After they did that, Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. It says that they knew that they were limited. They knew that they were sinful. And, and they saw things that they weren't determined to see. And so it says that they decided to cover themselves. And it says that God came in the cool of the day like he always did. And they were hiding. I don't know. I don't know how you hide from God, but <clears throat> they were they were attempting to do that. And God called out to guess who? Adam. Yeah, he called out to Adam. Didn't call out to Eve. Well, she, actually, she wasn't named yet, but she would be named a little bit later after the curse. He called out to Adam. And Adam used the classic. It was God's God asked him clearly. Adam, where are you? I mean, I'm sure that was rhetorical. God knew where he was. I guess he wanted Adam to think of where you are. And Adam said, I hid myself from you uh, because I was naked. And God said, the proverbial question is, Adam, did you eat from that tree? Y'all can just imagine that. Boy, what? Did you eat from that tree when I told you not to? And Adam said, yeah, yeah, I, I did. I did. And now my stomach is all hurt and I see some stuff, man. I don't I, I, I don't want to see this. Take this back. I, I don't want to see this. My stomach hurting. I'm naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? And God said, how'd you do this, Adam? And Adam used the proverbial excuse that we all use. Adam told God, it was that woman you gave. She did it. She was one. And it was essence he was telling, in essence, he was telling God, God, you really did this. I was all right until you put me to sleep. <laughs> I woke up again and, and now look at where I am now. I was, I was good before that. I was good. Never had a conversation with the serpent before like this, before that. I was good before that. You said I wasn't good. And that's what Adam is really saying to God. You, it was that woman that you gave me. You know, in other words, God, you need to go back and think about what you gave me. Again, God did begin to deal with, with the woman. He dealt with the serpent and he dealt with Adam. God kept his word in the whole process. And he gave, made us some promises in the middle of that process. My question is, whose voice is speaking to us? Now that we know, we know clearly what happened in the garden. So I realize that I'm not giving you revelation, nor am I attempting to. Just simply reminding us of who they were, who was speaking to them so that we can be careful today. So that we can be very careful today. It's crucial and critical now that we really hear from God. It really is. It's crucial and it's crucial now that we really yield to God, not just hear from him, but yield to him. Our actions have to catch up with our faith now because of what's happening on the earth. Uh, from the things that I see in my conclusion, it says, let us always remember it is God's voice that matters. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. No other voice matters. John 10, 4 and 5 <laughs> says, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. The fourth verse says literally, and when he put it forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. The fifth verse says, and a stranger will they not follow but will flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. Let's be careful not to get acquainted too much to all these voices. Let's be careful not to allow these voices to speak on behalf of God. In the garden, unfortunately, she allowed the serpent's voice to speak on behalf of God. And unfortunately, he Eight. Now, here's a little tidbit as we call Dr. Marbley back because we, we are done and we're going to let you uh, go as we call Dr. Marbley back. Here's a, here's a little uh, tidbit of information 
you already knew this. This is just something I discovered. Uh, uh, I know that you all are biblical scholars. So let me just share with you something I discovered. And the scripture bear backs it up. Adam did not get beguiled. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's, that's, I, I wish that I could say he did. That would be wonderful because then I would have something to plead with God about. But Adam didn't get beguiled. He did that by his own choice. Adam know what God said. God said it to him. Adam knew it. He was sitting there. I don't know how long he was sitting. I don't know when he got there. I mean, I, I have no idea. I don't know if, if Eve and the serpent was walking around for a while and chit-chatting and, and then came up upon Adam and Adam was chilling and Eve stopped there. And I, I don't know. I don't know if Adam was there the entire time. But Adam was clear. Oh my gosh. Rather Eve was confused or not. He wasn't. And when she ate, he could have let her be the only one to ate, but he didn't. So when he ate, it was a willful disobedience to God, which is why God came and called him and said, hey, man, what did you do? Adam, what'd you do? Adam said, it was that woman. <laughs> it was that woman. I know that's what I'm going to have to say to God. I said, God, it was that woman that you gave to me. You gave her to me, and she was confused. How come you didn't know that guy? When, when this serpent was talking, and I was sitting there not moving, how come you didn't come, God? God said to Adam, did you eat from the one that I told you not to eat? Rather than Adam saying, yes, I did, Lord. I really messed up. I'm sorry. How can I change this, what I see? How can I change this that's happened? Well, at that point, at that time, I guess repentance wasn't necessarily a part of the structure. But it is now. It is now. So whatever voice that we're hearing and whatever voice that we've heard and whatever voice that might have moved us or maneuvered us to a mistake, we can repent and come back to God's voice. We can repent and get restored with God. And then we can begin again to hear his voice. For this time, he's not just coming in the cool of the day, but he came by the way of the cross. And he inhabited us after that, after we accept Christ. So he can rise up right within us and speak to us. We don't have to wait for the cool of the day. We don't have to wait anymore, as many have said, for the priest to go into the Holy of Holies. Our high priest is right there on his right hand, and our high priest knows our name, and he's talking to God about us, and God is talking to us through his Holy Spirit. That should be the voice that's speaking to us. That should be the voice that gives the influence, and that should be the voice that speaks to us through others. Let's be careful. Let's always remember, it's God's voice that matters. And God said his sheep knows his voice. Amen. God bless you. Let's get Dr. Marbley back and close this out. Amen. Amen. So we're just going to go forward and do our announcements, our standard announcements. We got our standard announcements, our ways to give, our ways to give that's there for everyone. Uh, move this around. We got our own services when our services our Bible study, mm -hmm. our Sunday morning services, that information has not changed. Remember to support our the other ministries, uh, Light of the World, Edifying Ministries, mm -hmm. and Battlefield Worship Center. Uh, today. 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 Amen. We will be celebrating our own Kai or Kylie Anderson Phillips for her graduation. There's a graduation party. Today at 735 East Center it says, please use the red door, limited parking, come out for food, fun, and overall a blessed time. Gifts are welcome and appreciated. You can cash up at uh, dollar sign Nana Roos or checks and money orders or just cash. Give it to her in a hand. You'll be there. Uh, so we're meet. Oh, it's going to be at 735 East Center. Today, today. Also, our employment and training opportunities that we have. Anybody who wants more information, 
The Earn and Learn uh, program starts uh, June 21st. Then there's also another program that MATC has for IT. Uh, other employment things, Goodwill locations have employments on Tuesday. <laughs> Amazon have a, a Goodwill meeting together to have some type of virtual uh, or some on-site, that's on-site, mm -hmm. uh, like application type things. Uh, let's see, Maximus and Franciscan, uh, uh, medical care, those things. Children's is hosting a hiring, uh, virtual hiring event on the 17th. Uh, through five points, we have aviation exp uh, exposure and mentoring. So it looks like they're telling you a hands-on experience, an introductory experience into drones and building engines and those kind of things for uh, to, uh, adults or not adults, for young people ages 13 through 18. That is June 11th at 8 a.m. If you want to register for that, register on Eventbrite. Eventbrite, look for aviation exposure and mentoring, or you may call at 414-265-5546 if you need more information, okay? So there's things for the young people for the summer. Also, <coughs> the Milwaukee County Parks is hiring. <coughs> Michelle's is hiring or Michael's is hiring. Um, Let's see, Employment Milwaukee Bank Works is having a training program. Let's see, other resources we have, other resources are energy assistance, but then we have, you can become lead abatement certified. Uh, no work experience, mm -hmm. it's a 12 week uh, pr uh, apprenticeship program. So there's a stipend that you can get. So if anybody wants this information, take your pictures, and get that in for snapshots or whatever it is, snapshots, whatever it is, I mm -hmm. get it. Our affirmations for the month of June, I am forgiven. <clears throat> God pours out excellent, extravagant grace to me. Sorry about that. I am holy. I am dearly beloved. I am rescued from my past. My future is secured. My identity is in my salvation. This truth is my inheritance. I let go of negative thoughts about myself and embrace abundant mm -hmm. life. I release limiting beliefs, knowing I have what it takes to be successful. I am never alone. I'm accompanied by God at all times. And we have the scripture references there for you to follow up. Please take note of number seven. Please take number note seven. of number seven. Huh. I let go of negative thoughts about myself and embrace abundant life. So see Philippians 4, 6 through 8 for that. Amen. Are there any praise reports or anything? Kylie, Kai. Okay. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Graduation and moving forward in life. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Can we uh, one pray for Sister Dolores Glover Smith? She's having some issues with uh, you know her heart and she's a little swollen today. So we're trying to hope she doesn't have to go to emergency room. Okay. All right. Amen. Yes, we will. We will and then you. for us here over here in the Turner's household, we did a mortgage burning ceremony with uh, Habitat <laughs> for Humanity yesterday. And um, that was a beautiful feeling. I know, that's, know right. that's right. So my Man. husband was like, well, what is that? I told him, to be honest with you, I've only known churches to do <laughs> burnings. I haven't really known homeowners to do it. But it was a beautiful experience. What a blessing. And I, and I pray that everybody have a wonderful rest of the week. I'm back at work full time now. So okay. it's pretty good, I guess. That is a praise report. That is a praise report. That is. And then let's keep praying for our city and our nation because we already know what's going on. We just got to keep praying. Amen. 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 That's a beautiful praise report. Hello. That's hello, Amen. somebody. I love it. Amen. <laughs> I do. I love it. <laughs> Anyone else? We'll have to pray for Sister V. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Okay. So before we go, we got Pastor got one song. Uh here we got a benediction. So you want to pray for us? Okay. Amen. Let's 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 uh look to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, <laughs> who are capable and able of all things. We you said we could come to you for anyone and on anyone's behalf. And we come now, Lord, for our sister. We pray, Lord, that you take down all swelling. Oh, God, that you just touch with your hands of healing. We are reminded that you said on the cross 
and by your stripes we are healed. And we pray now that that would apply right now unto her life. And we're not selfish, but unto all of us. We need it. We need to know that our healing comes from you. We need to know that you're capable and able, and we believe it to be true for your word said so. And God, we are responding now to what your word says, that we're to call on you for you, you are concerned about us. Your word says to cast our cares and our troubles on you for you care about us. Mm -hmm. And you told us, Lord, that if we were burdened and heavy laden, mm -hmm. we could turn to you and mm -hmm. find rest. You promised that your yoke was easy and that your burden is light. And we trust you now, need you now. Mm -hmm. We know we can't make it without you. Have your way now. Remember Sister V, visit her, touch her, heal her. Oh God, we pray that all things that she can't do, that you can for you are an omniscient God and you're an omnipresent God. And there is nothing outside of your ability. So we pray now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you touch her and that you cause healing. And we pray, Lord, that her body would line up according to your voice and according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to play uh, one song. Benediction. As a benediction song. Amen. And then that it be all. Amen. We pray that God continue and richly bless you. Amen. All right. Just want y'all to go out and joyful. be joyful. Today. Amen. Today. Yeah, that the Lord has made you. Yeah. They're going to be joyful. So go out and be joyful. Amen. Amen. Don't let the clouds get in your way. <laughs> Amen. Y'all know how you felt. Like you said, you know how you felt when you were graduating, whenever that that last day, you woke yeah. up on the last day of school. Uh, Hello. <laughs> well, oh, you got that new pair of shoes. All right. That's all he said. Be joyful. Just Amen. like that. Amen. God bless you all. All right. We got a party. Yeah, we got a party. We got a party. All right. All right. Two, two o'clock. <laughs> Love you all. Love you all. Uh -huh. Bye -bye. <laughs>